Who is the Antichrist? This question has troubled theologians since the Patriistic era. Hippolytus, a theologian from the second century, interpreted the Antichrist allegorically as being one of the Roman emperors, such as Nero or Domitian. He also viewed heretics as being in league with the Antichrist. Origin of Alexandria viewed the Antichrist as any form of false wisdom and deception. Tychonus, a late 4th century African Donatist lay preacher, identified the Antichrist as any church member who is corrupted with evil. Centuries later, this view culminated in the Pope also being identified as the Antichrist. All of these speculations about the Antichrist morphed the biblical account into a constant changing myth. All of this debate about the Antichrist caused a real problem. Who or what is the Antichrist? Is the Antichrist a person, an institution, or an evil spirit? How would these questions be answered? Even though the Bible does not identify the Antichrist, the fruit of bloody anti-Semitism grew from the tree of the Antichrist myth, developed during the first few centuries of the Christian era. Irenaeus, in Against Heresies, linked the Antichrist with the Jewish tribe of Dan, while Hippolytus, in his exposition on the book of Daniel, also identified the Antichrist as a Jew from the tribe of Dan. Also in the 4th century, the Latin Tiburtine Sibyl from the Sibylline Oracles made the same linkage. Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century settled the issue. The Antichrist would be a Jew who had come from the lost tribe of Dan. In the 7th century, in the Eastern Roman Empire, a new contender for the Antichrist title entered the arena. The pseudo-Methodist linked the rise of Islam with the Antichrist myth. This work constantly referred to the followers of Islam as the sons of Ishmael. So many contenders for the Antichrist title. Who or what would inherit the throne? Why would all these different theories develop? The answer is simple. Society and history do change, and these changes put new spins on the filter of the ever-changing Antichrist myth. Often, the uncertainty of social and political unrest fosters new modifications of the Antichrist myth. The medieval period was adrift in the bloody mire of serious political unrest. Therefore, wide-ranging theories about the Antichrist swirled around Western Europe. The first few centuries of the second millennium saw the social, political, and religious climate of Western Europe drastically change. The breakup of Western Europe produced an atmosphere charged with apocalyptic speculation and millennium fever. The truth is, Antichrist doctrine became more a political tool than an eschatology concern. Many theologians thought that when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, the destinies of both were linked in a grand, glorious, divine scheme orchestrated by God. This theory was known as the Roman Christian Destiny Doctrine. To even envision a potential downfall of the empire was seen as an act of disloyalty to both God and Rome. With the conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity, 
the dark face of apocalypticism turned more optimistic. The literal interpretation of the book of Revelation fell out of favor, being seen as an outmoded Jewish literal reading of scripture. In the Eastern Roman Empire, Eusebius of Caesarea, the church historian and the fourth century court theologian to Emperor Constantine was one of the main leaders who rejected the literal apocalyptic reading of the book of Revelation. And he championed the Roman Christian destiny theology that also became known as imperial eschatology. He followed in the footsteps of Origen of Alexandria, who viewed the book as an allegory of the conflict between the good and evil found in the church and ourselves. Eventually, those leaders who joined Eusebius doubted the authenticity of the book of Revelation. At the end of the fourth century, two theologians carried forward the imperial eschatology and the allegorical interpretation of the book of Revelation, championed by Eusebius. These theologians were the great Bible translator Jerome and Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. In 410 AD, the bright destiny of Rome, linked with Christianity, would change. Alaric and the Visigoths sacked Rome. This incident shook Augustine to the point that his eschatology also changed. He renounced his support for the Roman Christian destiny doctrine for a pure allegorical understanding of Christianity and the Bible void of secular history. Why is this history of imperial eschatology important? With the collapse of the Western Roman Empire on September 4th of 476, all things would change. By this time, what remained of the Western Roman Empire was completely in the hands of federated Germanic troops. So began the Dark Ages. How could Rome and Christianity have a linked destiny when Rome no longer was a major world power? Theological opinions needed to be reevaluated. The Roman Emperor could no longer be viewed as the great protector of the Christian faith. Eschatology shifted away from the Roman Emperor to a future coming last world emperor who would usher in the era of the Antichrist. The theology of the last world emperor is nothing more than Roman imperial eschatology being repackaged to fit the political circumstances of the medieval world. The source of this legend can be found in the pseudo-Methodist. The legend teaches that a king of Greece must first come to power and triumph over all the enemies of Christendom and establish a peaceful Christian world. When the world is at peace, this last world emperor will go to Golgotha to surrender his imperial crown to God. This action would signal the coming of the Antichrist.